Hello and good morning and thank you so much for good morning depending on where you are. I am Raquel Moses. I am the CEO of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator and I am also the UNFCCC Global Ambassador for representing small island developing states and the Caribbean. At the Accelerator, we are seeking to create the world's first climate smart zone through collaboration. And I so thank you for being with us this morning. So today we will be discussing what and how we can to ensure a just transition across the Commonwealth. The window of opportunity to address the climate crisis is shrinking. The science is clear. Widespread and unprecedented weather events over the last few years have clearly shown that we can expect further climate chaos unless and until greenhouse gas emissions are quickly curbed and fossil fuels are phased out. Without drastic reduction in fossil fuels, the adaptation efforts of climate vulnerable regions and the Commonwealth small island states would be for naught. The latest IPCC report is unequivocal about the urgent need to phase out fossil fuels. It states that emissions need to fall by around 45% by 2030. And the reality is that it isn't that the emissions just fall and then we immediately see the impact. It takes a while. So we have to do it now. And we are in fact, a long way off. This graph shows that total energy consumption is made up overwhelmingly by fossil fuels and their use, unfortunately, especially considering geopolitical issues, continues to rise. Although renewable sources of energy are growing and they're growing exponentially and we're, we're thrilled about that, they make up still a very small portion of our energy supply. And actions by industrialized countries to decrease extraction of fossil fuels falls far below their commitments and certainly far below what is required to maintain the temperature rise below 1.5 degrees, 1.5 to stay alive. At current levels of fossil fuel use, I'm, I'm heartbroken to tell you that temperatures are projected to rise by 3%. And that sobering figure does not consider ongoing instability in energy supplies, which may well increase extraction and production of fossil fuels beyond projected levels. And we still have so much of fossil fuels being subsidized. So to discuss this, this easily solvable but, but um, ex existential crisis and how and to explore how we can make progress at COP27, I have with me a phenomenal and high powered panel and I'm really, really delighted to introduce them. And as I introduce them, I'll ask them to come on camera, please. So first we have Sharon Burrow. She is the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, representing 200 million workers across 163 countries. Welcome, Sharon. We have Tasneem Issa, Executive Director of Climate Action Network International. She's also a former commissioner in the National Planning Commission of South Africa, where she led the work on climate change and the just transition. Welcome, Tasneem. We have Alisi Rambukanwa, Rambukan Wanga, sorry. She is the Melanesian representative on the youth-led grassroots network of 350.org, Pacific Climate Warriors Council of Elders. Hello, Alisi. And Dipti Batnagar, International Program Coordinator on Climate Justice and Energy at Friends of the Earth International. Welcome, Dipti. We will also, uh, during this conversation, be hearing from Honorable Simon Kofi, Minister of Justice, Communication and Foreign Affairs uh, for Tuvalu via pre-recording. So let's kick it off, ladies. So we're gonna start by talking about what do we mean by just transition? And I'm going to ask uh, Sharon to go first. So just transition means we leave no one behind. We talk of in the financial field of no stranded assets. Well, we need to make sure there are no stranded people and no stranded communities. For the ITC and working people, we campaigned for just transition for almost 15 years. We didn't see it at Copenhagen, of course, but we did see it in the agreement, along with a commitment to human rights in the Paris Agreement. And many of the sisters here are actually on the team to get this done, 
primarily for workers, but more broadly for climate justice in communities. For us in workplaces, it means four very simple things. The first is that workers and their unions are at the table, that there are transparent agreements around how to climate and employment proof the workplace. For older workers, that actually means secure pensions. For workers who may be displaced uh, in uh, just prior to retirement age, but choose to retire early, a bridge to those pensions. For younger workers, it means uh, re uh, um, income support while there's reskilling and redeployment support to see that they continue to have a role within the company with upskilling in the transition or indeed in other areas. We know that there are in fact jobs in the transition. For every dollar, euro, unit of currency, we'll come back to this, but there are jobs, but not all of them will be in the same place. And indeed uh, for communities, where communities are affected, it means consultation with those communities about the future. Can you substitute uh, renewable energy? If the site's not appropriate, can you use the switching mechanism where coal-fired power stations are in play? Or indeed, what's the industrial hub that will recreate um, you know, the, the jobs in those communities? Because people will not trust and certainly will not trust to scale the changes we have to make. We are running out of time. So if they're not at the table, they don't understand the plan, they can't see hope in a future for themselves and their children, then the transition will not be just. And Tasneem, what does it mean to you? Thanks. And so building off what Sharon says, you know, I think it's important for us to recognize that transitions are already underway. Mm -hmm. And especially in the energy space. And so for us, trans the just transition has to be an emphasis on the justice element of it. So how do we ensure mm -hmm. right now, as transitions are happening, that we secure justice for those who are most vulnerable and, and impacted on by these transitions, these uh, of necessity, uh, radical transformational transitions that is required to keep us within that 1.5 stay alive uh, guardrail. So certainly for us, it is about emphasis on the justice element. And what secures that justice is, of course, a number of things. Firstly, as Sharon says, you know, we can't have just transition processes if those very uh, communities and workers who are impacted on this transition is not at the table. So procedural justice is fundamentally important to this. They have to be at the table, not just merely consulted in the kind of tick box exercise, but the knowledge of communities and workers need to inform the just transition plans themselves. It's not a technical exercise. We recognize this is about power, as well, who has the resources, who has the voice at these tables will have an impact on the outcome. And so the procedural justice right through to the outcomes justice is going to be important. And Dipti, tell us in, for you, just transitions. Definitely building on what these two lovely ladies have said. It's very much for Friends of the Earth International and for us, Justice Ambiental here in Mozambique, it needs to be about system change, just transition. I'll pick up one word from what Tasneem said, which was power. We need to see a change of power relations for just transition to actually be what we need it to be. We need to support unionized workers. I definitely agree with Sharon there. And we need to stop union busting. We need to make sure that unions are robust. We also need to think about non-unionized workers, unemployed peoples, self self-sufficient communities here in Mozambique, 70% of the people are subsistence-based communities. So we need to be able to have a transition that is just, that is equitable, and that is feminist. We need to constantly be bringing those core values, and we need to talk about a change of power relations because we see how power operates in the world, north, south, we see racism, we see all of the intersecting op oppressions and we need to build a world that is going to be completely different from that. Cli we call it the climate justice movement because climate change is absolutely terrible. And there are very clear historic reasons why we are in this place today. But going forward, we need things to be completely different. We need all of these intersecting oppressions 
to be dealt with as we are dealing with stopping the climate crisis and not that our so-called solutions further deepen these oppressions on the people who have already faced too much. So for us, the, the, the concept of just transition goes to the heart of changing power relations and calling for system change. So it's not a, a change of the energy system, uh, sorry, it's not only a change of the energy source. Okay, let's switch off coal and let's put something else. It's about the system in which it's operating, who is using the energy, who owns the energy. So that's the level at which we're trying to have this, this discussion. Yes, and Elisi. Thank you, Raquel. And beautiful sharings uh, from uh, all of the panelists. What I want to add on as well is that as Pacific Islanders, as climate activists from the Pacific, our narrative has been about how we are not victims of climate change. We're actually at the forefront and also fighting for you know, justice. And uh, the key things that we saw through the science, through the IPCC reports, through the COPs is that we need to keep fossil fuels in the ground. We need to keep the oil reserves and we need to look at uh, renewable sources of energy. But over the last, I can say, eight years that I've been part of this movement and working professionally in this space for about 10 years, we realized, we've learned that it's not just about keeping fossil fuels on the ground, as Dipti has said, um, but also about recognizing those who rely on it right now. Here in the Pacific, we're pushing for this because we are at the forefront. We are facing those challenges right now from climate change due to all the carbon emissions, due to the burning of fossil fuels. But while we are fighting this fight, we don't also want to fight the communities are also reliant on this industry right now. We recognize that they also have a right to live and survive. And in order for us to move forward successfully, we need to all go into this space together. And I really love how Sharon and Tasneem have already started to lay out the groundwork of how this can be done. And so from our perspective, you know, as climate activists from the Pacific specifically, we've had experiences where uh, those who work in the fossil fuel industry have come into our spaces to question and push back on our narrative of keeping fossil fuels in the ground because they rely on it. And, you know, our response to that is this, no, we do not want to take away your livelihoods or your right to also live. We want us to work together to a future through these transitions. Yes, Thank definitely. you. Thank you all so much. So now we're going to hear from, um, we also asked Minister Kofi, uh, Tuvalu's Minister for Justice, what a transition, a just transition means for one of the Commonwealth's smallest and most vulnerable member states. Let's hear what he had to say. Talo for people of the Commonwealth, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to speak at this Commonwealth Foundation critical conversation. As you all know, we in the beautiful Tuvalu Islands are on the front lines of the climate crisis. The rising sea level rate is nothing short of an existential crisis for all of us in the Pacific, and many of our islands could disappear within a few short decades. In Tuvalu, the realities of climate change are with us every day, forcing us to act and forcing us to think about legal ways to remain a state even if our land territory disappears. What does a just transition mean for the people of Tuvalu? Here in the Pacific, even though we are responsible for just a tiny fraction of global greenhouse gas emissions, we are absolutely committed to doing our part for the common good of our planet and future generation. But we need all nations, all governments to demonstrate real climate leadership. The issue of climate change is overwhelmingly a product of human activity within industrialized countries. As we draw closer to the next UN climate summit, the need to eliminate fossil fuels has become even more critical to our continued existence. It is therefore crucial that we have a clear pathway for a just transition. And by that, I mean a clear plan to ensure that the phasing out of fossil fuels does not further exacerbate the financial instability that climate change itself is causing. We must accept that industrialized countries have a historical responsibility for climate change. We must accept that they have an ethical and I believe also a legal obligation to protect countries like Tuvalu as we all move towards sustainable energy systems. A just transition for small island states like Tuvalu will mean greater access to climate finance to pay for the necessary investment plans to mitigate the effect of the climate crisis. It will mean greater debt relief and long-term debt restructuring. A just transition must support workers and communities to transition rapidly to renewable energy and towards an, e 
efficient uh, energy economy. We need a transition that leaves no country behind. The transition goal itself is under threat. COP26 did not deliver the clear message on the urgency of phasing out fossil fuels that those of us on the front line hoped for. And since then, we've seen governments supporting several fossil fuel projects and the largest oil and gas sale in history. The science is pointing to a 2.4 to 2.6 degree increase in temperatures. The demand driven by current fossil fuel supply will make it impossible for us to meet our Paris targets. We must move away from the expansion of coal, oil and gas production if we are to remain in alignment with international commitments and regional efforts. We must focus not only on limiting fossil fuel emissions, but also on limiting the extraction and production of fossil fuels and halting the construction of new coal, oil and gas projects. We must do all of this in a way that does not further damage the fragile economies and societies of those countries least to, to blame and most at risk. At the UN General Assembly, the Pacific nation of Vanuatu called for the development of a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty to phase down coal, oil and gas production and enable global transition for every worker, community and nation with fossil fuel dependence. I myself have supported the development of such a treaty in various fora. Such a mechanism would focus on the implementation of Paris Agreement goals and hold governments to account for the production of fossil fuels within their jurisdiction. Wonderful. So I'll introduce, ask the panel to come back on and we're going to start talking about what are some of the opportunities and obstacles to enhancing progress towards a just transition. And I'm going to ask Dipti to, to get us started. That was a, a really beautiful speech from the minister. And we need to, we need to diversify our struggle. I think that's, that's what Friends of the Earth is really trying to, to talk about is that there are very clear energy solutions. And the minister talked about that. We need to stop fossil fuels. We need to stop other forms of dirty and harmful energy beyond just fossil fuels. Because again, it's not about changing the source. It's about changing the system in which that energy is produced and distributed and consumed. We talk about energy sufficiency. We have a set of principles that we produced, our People Power Now Energy Manifesto, and energy sufficiency is one of them. So each person on earth to live a life of dignity should have a sufficient amount of energy and not have 600 million people across this continent of Africa without a light bulb in their homes and many, many others who are abusing energy. So there are a set of principles that need to govern the transition to 100% renewable energy world for everybody, not for the elites who can afford to buy solar panels, but for everybody. But also I, that is one step. We need to talk about rights. Sorry, Raquel, we need to talk mm -hmm. about land rights and we need to talk about changing systems in bigger ways, but I'll, I'll stop here for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So fossil fuel energy systems are deeply woven into the fabric of economies, labor markets and individual lives, and there have been massive investments in renewables. But is it enough? Are we investing in the right things? How do we reduce global reliance on fossil fuels and encourage and support a cleaner energy path, including for de developing economies so that they can access energy they need to grow and prosper? What incentives are needed around renewable energy sources to improve progress and decision making? And I'm going to ask uh, Sharon to respond to that one. So there are three things here to, to actually put on the table. The first is that the Secretary General at the UN made it very clear that if we don't actually move on from our addiction to fossil fuels, we are seeding the destruction of uh, not the planet, but the existence of vast numbers of humanity. And so that's an existential crisis to human beings. It's an emergency. It's bigger than a war. And unless people actually sit at the table and are committed. The second thing, then we won't make the grade, obviously. Then the second thing is that each government is indeed required to submit an NDC, but have a look at them. The ambition is way too low. You've already indicated where we're headed in scientific uh, temperature increase projections, and um, and those NDCs, less than 
5% of them actually have a commitment to just transition. So people are still not included in thinking. And unless we switch our economies to put people and the planet at the heart of economic planning, of new economic thinking, then we will fail. The third thing is that we give out the, fear, the figures vary, but let's say at the bottom uh, end of it, $1.8 trillion of harmful environmental subsidies. Now, I'm willing to admit that in industrialising countries, in a development model based around industry, then trade union leaders like me for the last 30 years have encouraged support for jobs in industry. But we now need to repurpose those subsidies. Our view is don't take them from the industries, repurpose them as incentives for um, indeed uh, investing in renewable energy. So in other words, use it or lose it for good purpose. And the Alicia, final, oh, I'd say, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, one final thing about jobs. We have to be really optimistic about this because for every 10 jobs in renewable energy, there's five to 10 in manufacturing and supply chains. There's a, a further 30 to 35 in the broader ecosystem of service and, uh, and supply chain support if they're good jobs, decent jobs, just wages, right space. That's how you build communities. That's how you sustain communities, even through the chain. So we know the technologies are there. You don't have to wait for magic. We know that the jobs outcome is there. We need governments and employers working with uh, workers and communities be serious about the transition planning. Alisi, so, and what must we do to ensure that that much needed change um, does not end up replicating the unfairness and inequity that is already built into the way that, that energy is currently produced and shared? And, you know, going back to Dipti's point about, we don't need just a change in the energy, we need a change in the whole system. Yes, I, I agree with Dipti and Sharon's points about the need for this change. And, um, you know, and you also had mentioned about what, what incentives are in place. And, you know, for, for most, if not all companies, well, like the incentive is money, profit. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, and when, when we're working in this space, one of the things that we do is looking at where the financial flow is coming from. Um, because you can ask the question of what's the incentive for them to change or what is encouraging them to stay where they are right now. And that is also it, that uh, financial institutions, the banks, they are currently continuing to fund fossil fuel extraction. And so there is absolutely no incentive to move away from it. And so for us, part of our work is looking at these financial flows and stopping it and cutting it and then encouraging it to be redirected into the places that Deepthi has mentioned, that Sharon has also mentioned, um, so that we are all moving away from, you know, we're all transitioning together. And um, for the businesses, I mean, for companies, that won't happen until the current incentives are stopped, until they know that they cannot make a profit from the way things are working right now then they will move. And that's the reality of how we have seen the work move, especially through the Pacific. And that's what also motivates us to work through these things as well. Yeah. Yeah, but don't we know that there's there's a lot of money in the transition? I think it's not just, and I agree with you, it's about the money, but isn't it also about the fear of change? Because, you know, we know mm. that there's money in what we're doing now, but there's also money in the transition. But yeah. it is about how do we manage that change? So I'll ask Tasneen. So small and vulnerable states are already in a cycle of debt exacerbated by climate impacts. A rise in energy prices and post-pandemic economic recovery the cost of transitioning energy systems would be crippling. What is needed from the global finance system and international debt rules so that the much needed transition of energy systems does not impose further burdens on people and countries who can least afford to carry them? Uh, thanks, uh, Rakhal. And I think it's a really pertinent question to ask just off the back of the meetings of the IMF and World Bank held in Washington recently. And if you followed that, you would see massive, massive protests by people across the world, actually, um, drawing attention to this very challenge and calling for debt cancellation and restructuring of the debt. So certainly there's a big attention right now on this. 
and it included some interesting developed countries who also want to see the reform of the World Bank and uh, restructuring and review of their, their debt regulations. And what did we get? No outcome, no outcome. So this is what we're facing, right? The institutions that's supposed to provide the solutions to heavy debt burdens are not willing to change the rules. The rules of the game is embedded, entrenched, and again, power plays into this. So that means our hard work continues, but at least what we can feel comfortable about is that there's growing attention to this, uh, that the other countries are starting to come in and we just have to keep the push as well. So I do want to support Minister Kofi's point about this being a moral and ethical issue and that even through the UNFCCC, we should be ensuring that the funding we're talking about is public finance that we are talking about additional finance and not uh, you know, the kind of uh, reshaping and reframing uh, of existing loans, for example. Loans is something we really have to move away from. So yeah. you know, it has to be based funding. Now, I do want to make a another point, uh, Rekko, just in, in addition to every other point that's been made. I think that this approach also of, of putting in silos the different transitions, like we talk about just energy transition. Yeah. And when Dipti says that we're talking about system change, then this has to be an economy-wide transition, yeah, a society-wide yeah. transition. And yes, of course, energy is an important and critical part of that. But we cannot divorce exactly because yeah. of the points you've made you know, a just energy transition. And one of the biggest obstacles that I actually want to put out here in a very provocative way, it, uh, it's emerging in the UNFCCC space, not in the negotiations, but outside, are these new partnership initiatives driven by developed countries called just energy transition partnerships. Now, I'm saying this as a South African, the first so-called model for such a partnership was in South Africa, quite frankly, there's nothing just about the just energy transition partnership. It's some kind of, well, firstly, the financing is not clear. It sounds like they're changing it around and using existing, it's loan based, not grant based. And inside the country on our side, the recipients of this funding, there's no just processes that really includes unions and workers and impacted communities about what the money must be spent on. So we certainly should be very careful because in COP27, they're going to start cherry picking which other countries they're going to support. And let me be very clear, small island developing states are certainly not going to be there because they don't see this as an important area for investment. So be very wary of these initiatives that use terms of just energy transition or just transitions when they absolutely have nothing to do with justice. We have to be very wary about these initiatives being driven, especially by rich countries. Well, I, you know, when we talk about when we talk about the challenge that we face, I wonder if it is how we talk about climate finance, because we talk about climate finance like it's one thing. And most people, when they think about climate finance, some people mean that and other people mean grants. And because we're not being specific about what, what it is we're talking about, we're getting that, oh, well, there's money, oh, no, there's not money. There's not the right kind of money. And, and, and I want to go now to, to Dipti, go back to Dipti, uh, you know, um, Mozambique went through a horrifying cyclone Idai, which you're still recovering from. I mean, you know, there's so much yet to be done, and it seems as though the world has forgotten. You know, when, we, when we're thinking about building global consensus around just transition, you know, at the recent uh, UN General Assembly, the Prime Minister of Vanuatu spoke about the need for a fossil fuel non proliferation proliferation treaty excuse me and and is that is that helpful could that be supportive and what about things like loss and damage how do you feel about that considering what Mozambique has been through you know I heard uh, I've, I've talked about this a few times in webinars I heard a, a, a voice note from a woman who was on her roof leaving a voice note 
for her brother in Beira city, central Mozambique saying, I don't know if I'm ever going to see you again. Mm. You know, these are real people who are already being affected by the climate crisis, who have been affected by 500 years of genocide and slavery and colonialism. And people deserve a life of dignity. People deserve a chance to be able to survive. And I want to just bring some numbers for you. Since you talked about Cyclone Idai, Raquel, Cyclone Idai and Cyclone Kenneth, which hit the same year, 2019, a month apart, and all of the flooding that it caused in Mozambique and in Zimbabwe and Malawi that year, it increased the poverty level from 64% to 79%. That those climate-induced tragedies and Mozambique is going down the path, talking about fossil fuels, Mozambique is hurtling down the path of gas extraction. So the mm. biggest gas field found anywhere in the world in the last 10 years has been found off the coast of northern Mozambique, where Cyclone Kenneth hit. And the numbers for the money that the state of Mozambique could receive in 2040 one year, like what happened in 2019, one year of climate impacts will wipe out 75% of the life cycle money through the life cycle that Mozambique would receive in 2035 and 2040. We want our countries, going back to fossil fuels, the global north created this crisis. They built their societies on fossil fuels. They need to do the, the, the first and deepest work to stop that, to stop fossil fuels, but also a message to our countries in the global south. Whose back are you going to stand on if you're going down the same development pathway that the colonizers did? We who come from post-colonial countries, you know, I've lived in the Commonwealth most of my life in India, where I was born and Mozambique, where I'm married. We need to choose a different path. We need to, to say that yeah. our people are important and their life of dignity is important. And we need to choose a diff different development pathway. So the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, it is a hard word, Raquel. It is definitely <laughs> a hard word to say, but it's an important concept because we need to be understanding that fossil fuels are just as dangerous as nuclear weapons. But we need to go a step further, right, and talk about what is going to replace it, because people are using fossil fuels right now to stay alive. Yeah, it's keeping yeah. hospitals running. It's keeping schools running. Those are important. Let's focus on what needs to be funded. What should the energy be used for? And then let's figure out collectively, how are we going to do it? Can I add to that? Mm -hmm. You know, Tasneem's right about, you know, debt and financing. But we can do something immediately if we learn the lessons of vaccine nationalism. This was a scandal. If you think that this was about saving lives and those uh, nations that held the pharmaceutical production companies, almost all of them refused to share the technology, refused to share the, the knowledge so that in fact the resilience could be built in to the production, to the jobs, to the life-saving health uh, services in, in developing countries, then it's the same for the renewable energy technology. Absolutely the same. If we exist with the current IP model, then we are denying people lives. Because if we don't move quickly everywhere to renewable energy as the source of energy security, then we are in fact putting individual lives as well as whole nations, particularly poor nations at risk. So this is absolutely correct. I'm shocked, I understand, but I'm shocked by the fact that the short-sightedness of investing in gas infrastructure, when it will become a stranded asset, again in 15 to 20 years, pick a number, and people will be left behind. And again, they'll be in the developing countries because the, the, the countries of the North will actually emerge from a lot of their fossil fuel addiction, let's hope all of it, but we will see that imposed elsewhere. And so we have to fight for a different intellectual property model as well as a different model of financing and debt relief. Finally, I can I mm -hmm. just say that on this question, there is no doubt that the treaty is a wonderful campaign and we should support it. But what we really need to do is take on 
the price gouging and the profit, um, uh, the, the strictures of a profit generating machine that stops the countries actually sharing in our knowledge and our, and our capacity to share both wealth and knowledge around new technologies. Um, I, I just wanted to, to ask Alicia, I mean, we, we talk a lot about what's wrong and, you know, as a, as a, as a youth activist, what, what can we do? And then from there, we'll go to questions from the audience. Alisi, you just disappeared. Um, for those who may not be aware, I am not in the most ideal place to take this call. I've got deployed to the islands. It's the southern part of Fiji. And um, it's very difficult to have electricity out here. Internet connectivity is not that good. But I'm so thankful to be part of this. Um, you know, two things I wanted to share just listening to Deepthi and Sharon is that for us in the last six years, we have experienced two category five cyclones, unprecedented here in Fiji. We've also experienced multiple category three, four cyclones, and it is now cyclone season in Fiji. And they're predicting between one to four cyclones at a category of three upwards to five. At the same time, we still have communities from 2017 where we had our first category five recovery, communities that were hit in 2000 and 2021 that are still recovering. And now we are going into another cyclone season. And so when I was hearing the conversation about climate financing, lost and damage, for us, it's how can we be immediately assisted? Because the mechanisms to access any of this funding to rebuild the communities from my province even, uh, it's, it's, in, it's insane. It's in, almost impossible to access the funding to be able to rebuild their homes. Um, and so it's about these mechanisms, about jumping through so many hoops to access the mechanisms that exist right now. And then we get into the conversation how we can make that better. You know, this is a question of accessibility, um, of what are all the things that need to be in place in order for communities that are used as sort of the image of the, the impacts of climate change that are taken to this COP events, 27 COPs now, 27 global discussions. And, you know, as Tasmin and said about the other meeting with the World Bank, nothing has come out of it. And people might say, okay, yes, we have made progress, but until we stop having UNF triple C COPs because we have resolved the climate crisis, we can also say, you know, I'll be like thinking about it, we can also say that we are not doing enough yet. Um, and and what can we do about it? You know, these treaties, like every other step we've taken, they are important steps to take, um, but we should be more ambitious about our targets and our goals. Absolutely agree that we should be more ambitious. We now have a pre-recorded question from Dr. Michelle Scobie of the University of the West Indies from the Caribbean where I'm from. And so we're gonna uh, give her the stage and turn off our cameras and mics while we listen to her question. Hello, I am Michelle Scooby, Senior Lecturer at the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. My areas of focus have been global environmental governance and international law, particularly from the perspective of small states. And I'm very interested in issues of climate justice, energy security, and small island developing states. As you know, since small island developing states contribute minimally to the climate problem, but they lack the resources to adapt. And many of the funded renewable energy projects are pilot projects uh, with a limited time horizon, far shorter than what would be needed for sustainable implementation in societies that lack the funds and the infrastructure to ensure projects longevity. Some argue that governments do not have the funds and probably should not be the ones invested in renewable energy infrastructure and technologies that are costly, rapidly changing and have uncertain futures, while there's so many basic health and education needs in these societies that are unmet. Others argue that it is where the funding is and that SIDS have signed on to global agreements and should have aggressive mitigation targets. So my question to you is, have you seen initiatives that can take away some of the risk of adapting to these new technologies and um, taking the risk out of the hands of governments of these poorest states, but that can still guarantee longevity past the pilot project stage? 
Thank you. Any any thoughts on on uh, Tasneem? Can we go to you? I don't have any concrete example of uh, projects and longevity, et cetera, but I do think we need to come back to the point that Sharon started provoking around finance and where it can come from. And very specifically, because it's already been highlighted by the UNSG himself. And this is exploring the option of windfall tax, tax the fossil, tax the, the polluters. Right, there's that one. What was in some of the discussions in the IMF uh, meetings recently, there was also the opening up of the conversation about a wealth tax. Because if we see the research on this, we know that the top 10 to 1% of the world, the elites in the world, are actually responsible also for firstly sucking up all our carbon space and also for their emissions themselves. So I think we, you know, we are. Often in these conversations, we, and rightly so, we should be looking at private sector investment and looking at how we can crowd in private sector. The scale has not materialized. These are the discussions that we're having right now in the UNFCCC for the new goal. So certainly, you know, if you back this up with what Sharon also says, if you look at technology and IP, and we recognize that what we're really talking about is the common good the well-being of all of us, the well-being of humanity, then surely these issues of profit-making, et cetera, et cetera, is something we really have to take head on, really have to take head on. So that's the one thing that I wanted to say. The other thing that I want to say is, you know, when we talk about loss and damage and we talk about just transition and you hear what Dipti says and Alisa says, uh, you know, talking about just transitions in a context where literally the country is being wiped out by impacts. I want to talk about, i give you an example of a recent injustice that needs to be factored in because just transition, and I said, is not just about mitigation. We have to factor in issues of loss and damage. It has a huge impact on workers. In the US, when Hurricane Ian hit Florida, the US was able to give 39,000 US dollars for recovery to individuals, plus an additional $39,000 for the recovery of personal losses like wedding rings or automobiles. And then you look at what happened in Pakistan. You look at what's happening in Nigeria right now. You listen to what Dipti is telling you, Alice is telling you, in developing countries, there's no such thing as, you know, here yeah, we are government, we're going to give you $39,000 for anything anything, they're still recovering in Mozambique, injustice. And that is where the other side of the finance picture needs to be factored in. And that is the establishment of a finance facility for loss and damage under the multilateral system, not just insurance for loss and damage. That's not sufficient, but a mult that is just and equitable and reaches the hands that it needs to reach. The local communities impacted on these climate change. That's justice in transitions as well. But I think the question is less about what needs to happen and more about how do we get that to happen? Because right now, I think what we know is, you know, and we're talking a lot about can renewables solve it? We're talking about renewables like they're new. Renewables have been around for decades. What we know is that the transition, especially for small island developing states and developing economies, it makes sense. The problem that we have is not financing those projects because 88% of, of the $632 billion spent in 2019 went to climate mitigation projects. Once you have good financials for your project, it can attract uh, commercial funding. The problem is to prepare those projects to attract commercial funding. That's the gap. And that requires philanthropic funding, that requires grant funding, and that requires the kind of funding which is less than 6% of the funding that we're seeing is that. And that's the challenge that we're facing. So if it is that, let's say we want to police the, the wealthy, how are we going to do that? Because they're the ones who are making the rules. So what can we do then to convince those with the power, with the, the ability to help change the system? What can we do to help them to, to either want to transition, 
Is it that we're speaking to the wrong people? You know, we're talking to the UNFCCCs, we're talking to the IMFs. Should we be talking to the people? What, you know, Dipti, Elisi, Sharon, who, what can we do? Because we're not, I, I don't feel like we're powerless, but with, with whatever we've been doing, back to, to Elisi's point, whatever we've been doing hasn't been working well enough. You know, I think someone asked a question about the absorptive capacity of these small island developing states and these Commonwealth countries. And I think part of it is what Elise was speaking about. It is that we are, and, and back to what Dipti was saying as well, and Sharon to some, you know, everyone's been talking about, the fact that we are continue to be victimized post-colonialism, it just means that we are slower to take decisions about transitioning because we are so weary of the things that that the new solutions, the 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 the, the transition plan. Because you know, it's it's just not been just. But it, we are because of time. We we now have to move on to what are some of the lessons on just transition since COP twenty six. Looking forward to COP twenty seven because again, you know, we we can't um, as the high level champion Nigel Topping often says is you know we can't just sit admiring the problem. We have to come up with some new solutions. So I think Tasneem, I'm going to ask you during COP twenty six. South Africa entered into an agreement with the US, UK and EU countries, the Just Energy Transition Partnership. And I know you, you, you have quite a few, quite a bit of skepticism around, you know, when we talk about just energy transition, but now a year on, what lessons can we learn? What was achieved? What more needs to be done? Thanks, Raquel. And I think that's an important uh, point and we need to learn from this. It's been a year on and nothing is moving yet and things are still being figured out. And I really think that part of the, you know, it's not bad to have these kinds of initiatives and partnerships. There are two things that we need to learn though. One is that it cannot be a cherry picking exercise by donor countries. We need to, and especially the points that you've just made. So why is, why are small island states always the last uh, in the whole, you know, um, intervention, partnerships, arrangements. So we have to address that, no cherry picking, that to ensure robustness, accountability, transparency, we might want to take these outside, outside partnership initiatives and actually build it into something that can be monitored within a multilateral process without killing it, without you know, then spending years and years and years of further discussion, but how do we maintain accountability, et cetera? And the third one is that it must be true to the concept of a just transition, that the labor movement has fought for for so many, many, many decades. And that as Dipti says, they must stop the union bashing. These projects, these partnerships literally are leaving the workers out of it, let alone impacted communities. And that's the other lesson that we learned, that when we come to COP27, understanding the failings and weaknesses of existing model, if it gets rolled out, which I believe it is, then we need to ensure that all of these lessons, these weaknesses are addressed and we have to raise the solution to the problems that we've identified in the past year. Absolutely. And Sharon, I'm going to ask you. So, so Tasneem yeah. mm -hmm. and I always see eye to eye, but there's a finer point on the just energy transition partnerships. And I absolutely accept, Tasneem, we may not have got it right, but it is an attempt to say if you think energy, and I totally agree, it's not the whole picture. We've been fighting for industrial transition in every sector. But if you think of energy as the tram tracks, whether it's the big grid, co-generation, energy co-ops, and we have to look at the whole scope of possibilities that democratise energy. But if you look at many of our countries, they're built on the big grid, big utility uh, provision. They're good jobs, so this is painful for unions. But if we don't get the finance, at least to the point of fundamental finance in for people to make the transition, if we don't hold the reins a little in terms of what the consultative mechanism looks like, what the agreement looks like, and I absolutely accept that South Africa doesn't have it right yet, but we will fight for more money into other developing countries on this model as a first step. And your point about transitions not being just, absolutely, which is why we fought for this concept. 
because most people see transition as something done to them. At the heart of just transition is something that people are engaged in. And I remember the minister from um, South Africa actually saying that if you go to communities where ESCOM is actually operating, you will find uniforms on every clothesline in the community. And that's the extent of the challenge to transition the, uh, the energy provision. I think we could talk for ages about other models of energy and how we manage to make sure that communities are involved. But suffice to say, every sector has to transition. There are solutions. And can I just say to Elise's point, then that's my fear, that again, developing countries, as they have always been, become the subject of dumping grounds for people to eke out that last dollar, euro, unit of currency in profit from uh, technologies that will be, in fact, moved on from. We need the Swedish model where the north of uh, the northern region of Sweden not just is engaged in development itself around things like hydrogen for clean steel and so on, but they are partnering with other communities. We need that everywhere. Share the finance, share the technology, share the skills, share the outcomes. So Sharon, just to be devil's advocate, do you think that do you think that the workers are ready for the transition because of the risks that it proposes to what they know now? Workers are frightened. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I walk the coal fields. I walk the coal-fired power station communities. We talk to the people in industry all the time. We have a just transition centre, which is enabling workers to have the skills to be at the table, to share their own knowledge. But we don't have a choice. And so when workers say to me, do we really have to transition? I say, I'm not going to lie to you. You're going to choose between a future for your children and grandchildren and even an uncomfortable one for yourself, or we're going to build something new that has at its heart our demands for inclusion. So the difference this time is that if if people are genuinely at the table, if they genuinely understand, if they're accompanied by their unions and indeed the communities, then we can demand an economic model that works. But we've got to be committed to it, all of us. Yeah. Dipti, do you think that the Just Transitions Declaration coming out of COP26 went far enough? Nothing coming out of COP26 (laughs) went far enough, except that they signed... That's an easy question. (laughs) For me to be devil's advocate now, <laughs> no, <laughs> except that they they actually pushed bad things forward as well, which is Article Six, which is false solutions, carbon markets, carbon offsetting. Don't worry about all those emissions, those pesky emissions. We're going to have land and forests that are just going to magically suck it up. We're going to have all these geoengineering schemes that are just magically going to make emissions disappear. It's not going to happen. The COP is an arena of struggle, and we as Friends of the Earth definitely use that arena of struggle, but we need to build so many other arenas of struggle because that space is definitely failing the people of this continent, the people of the global south. The the basic principles that were envisioned, that were enshrined in the Rio Declaration, historical responsibility, common but differentiated responsibilities, these are being constantly undermined by the countries of the global north. So when we go into a space like COP26 and now handing over the baton to COP27, we will go there to be rabble rousers. We will go and raise our voices and say no false solutions, you know, repay the climate debt. But at the same time, that that arena is definitely failing our people, whether it's the COP26 just transition declaration or whether it's everything else, the lack of finance coming out. So we need to actually be building what what Sharon was saying, the workers are terrified, everyone is terrified because so many people are living on the edge right now. People are facing multiple interrelated crises, not just the climate crisis, not just that, that wave coming towards them, but so many people are already drowning inside that wave. So we need to be, we need to be speaking to people's agencies and we need to be talking about rights. So for subsistence-based communities who are holding onto their lands and forests and using those resources to keep themselves alive, we need to be talking about 
you know, how do they protect those land rights? Uh, the when when the minister spoke at COP26 last year, his very provocative video standing in the water, he talks about the maritime rights of Tuvalu. Even if Tuvalu disappears, we need to have these maritime rights because this was our land. We need to be talking at that level of rights and sovereignty for people. Doesn't matter if my land disappeared, this was my ancestors' land. And you need to recognize that I'm a legitimate person on this earth. You know, this is the, this is the level at which we need to be talking about. And, and talking about people's power, people having agency to know that we need, you know, it's terrifying because we need the transition to happen right, right now. But we need it also to be just and equitable and feminist, because if it's not, it's going to create a whole bunch of other oppressions that are going to be really damaging to people's lives and livelihoods. And that's not OK. So we so, need to be giving people agency to make decisions that 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 affect them. Is Elise still with us? Um, if not, I'll ask to, to, to Tasneem, you know, let's focus on. What, what is it going to take? What is it going to take to, 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 to hit a tipping point? What do you think it's going to take? Is it, is it that we just build momentum towards each cup? What do you think it's going to take for us to finally sort of get the message across and see the action that we want to see? Unmute, unmute. I think that uh, Dipti starts the conversation, right? And I think if you just look at it, it's growing at the momentum of people using their power, using their agency is growing and growing across the world. So I, that is for me, I am a firm believer in people's power, especially when it comes to huge transformations. I come from South Africa, I've been through that. And so that experience will always teach me that fundamental lesson. But I also think that things are going to get so, I'm really sorry to say this, but we're living through it already. Things are just going to get bad. We, the impacts of climate change are being felt, it's ravaging, it's devastating, and it's not, you know, confined to the global south alone now, it's getting more ravaging even in the globe north. We always said before, you know, maybe people will wake up when it starts hitting them in rich nations, which it has, and they're still slow at response, I must admit. But I think, you know, just the reality is going to get worse and worse for all of us to wake up. And then I think that the solutions are going to become more real. And one of it that we didn't really explore much in this, in this conversation is this growing momentum behind the fossil fuel, the non-proliferation of fossil fuel treaty idea. There's really been two heads of state already, now Tuvalu's minister who said he's endorsing, cities across the world, indigenous peoples, parliamentarians. There's just a wave of momentum around this. And of course, this is not an immediate solution, but there's no other way if we don't get a fair and equitable phase out and planned phase out of fossil fuels in the world, then we're not going to have a just transition. So these things are all connected. So I think uh, as we all explore, there's solutions out there. The alternative technologies are there. It's becoming more and more affordable. We need a proper phase out and equitable phase out of fossil fuels. Small island states shouldn't be bearing that burden at all. <laughs> at all, and then to look at mechanisms to exactly support those who are least responsible for the crisis, but need to themselves transition to a better life, a better system, what can be put in place for that? And again, I think the moral and ethical responsibility here is exactly what Dipti again reminds us of. Rich nations have to meet their moral and ethical obligations and responsibilities. So Sharon, I just want, I want to be, I want to be devil's advocate here because, and this is something, this is not me just being devil's advocate. This is what I firmly, firmly believe. And you are out there talking to people. Do you think that it is perhaps our pessimism that has us spiraling towards failure versus being more optimistic about what's possible and the hope, creating hope and, 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 painting the picture of a, of a future. The way that we've sold the crime, climate crisis from the beginning has been, we are spiraling towards doom versus there is this huge opportunity in our future. Do you think that that's part of it? Or, you know, because I feel like it's just, it just feels like it's more of the same versus people being hopeful and optimistic and, and looking forward to a different, a different path. 
I totally agree. You can't ignore the science and we have to stand firm on the fact that we believe the science and we have to act on it. But if you don't give people the solutions, and that means hope, if you don't involve them in shaping their world, then why would they have any trust in a future mm. when, as a, an African colleague of mine says, every day when we talk about, you know, the, the failing trust in democracy and we don't have a better system and yet we're down to about 68 democracies in the world and um, around 20% only of people live in truly free countries. So when you talk about this, he says, but Sharon, most of our people have never seen a democracy dividend. So there's the question. If you can't see the future, if you can't actually start to feel that you have the opportunity and security coming your way, then of course people are going to resist. The anger, the despair will grow and as Neem's right, it's going to get worse before it's, uh, it's getting better. So we need everybody on the front lines of this, but we need people to have the ideas, the creativity, the collective determination to change our world. And that means making it uncomfortable for those who want to continue a world that's about profit at any cost, that's about, uh, you know, closed communities where people are safe while the rest of the people struggle just to survive. So we have a lot of work to do, but hope has always been innovation, hope, drive, collective action. It's always been the basis of how we change things we don't like. This is a bigger but just another one of those challenges. Yeah. All right. So now we, we go to, we transition quickly to um, questions from the audience. All right. And there's some really exciting ones. So one, um, one person, Kapo Joseph is asking about how do we get more people, especially on the African continent, aware of what's taking place? So Dipti and Tethany, you're both on the African continent. How do we, you know, are, are we collaborating with, with African media? How are we getting the message out so that everyone, I mean, if we're talking about just transition and, and sort of democratizing um, climate solutions, I think it starts with people just being aware of why some of these things are happening. I can speak, I can speak from, from our side. We have Friends of the Earth Africa across this continent. We are working with so many other different allies. We've got the Africa Climate Justice Collective, which is right now, as we speak, doing a session on energy access. And we are having the Africa People's Counter COP. It's going on right now. You can check out africaclimatejustice.org. Uh, we need to build those networks. We need to be able to build power across this continent. There are so many people in this continent who are really invested in their countries, in this continent, in the world. And we need to be able to hear from them. I mean, most of the people in Mozambique don't even get a chance to go to school and to learn. And people have such a hunger for learning and contributing and connecting with their peers across the world. And we're trying to do whatever that we can in a very, very small way to be able to to be able to connect people, bring more people in. There are so many, you know, climate justice organizations on this continent who are trying to do that. We need to be able to give that power to people. Eh? So people feel like I can do something. Interestingly, there was a very um, interesting question in the chat. I was having a quick look. Someone saying, I feel like I'm not doing enough. And I think that's an important point because we need to feel like I did everything in my personal capacity to confront these crises. I did yeah. everything that I can, but also our power comes from being linked up with other people and seeing that it's not just me. Oh, wait, Mozambique is having gas extraction. So is South Africa. So is Togo and Ghana. What's going on? Wait, there are some systemic issues at work here. We are not alone. You know, sometimes we go to a community and we'll take photos of other communities across the world, Indonesia, uh, Togo, Colombia that are facing the same problem so that people feel like they're not alone in their struggles. Yeah, I think yeah. we need to link up humanity and that is going to be our, our biggest challenge because social media doesn't make it easy to link up on positive issues. There's a lot of negative reinforcement that people are constantly getting. We need to flip this the, the script and say, you, you know, all of these 
lives are really, really important. All of these yeah. perspectives are really, really important. How can we have people talking to each other across the world and building power that way? Absolutely agree. And Tasneem, I, I, I definitely, I, I've seen those questions in the chat. We have Dwight Gita from Guyana is asking, what can we do? And I think it is not, and back to Kapo's question, not necessarily about, is it about media? And I think the media is important and we definitely need to engage the media, but the media will follow the momentum. So I think it is about each of us making sure that we're reaching out to others, educating them, sharing information, validating the information that we share, but that we are engaging each other in these conversations because we understand how important it is that we are all on the same page and understanding where we're moving towards. Stephanie. So Raquel, I think what happens in Africa though is that it is the usual suffering, very similar to small island developing states. There's so much happening on this continent and you will not read that in any mainstream newspapers ever. And so one of the most important things, of course, is that we must strengthen our own media on the continent and amongst you know, non-state actors, if that's what we want to call them. So certainly that is one. You know, beside raising awareness, what we also undermine quite actively is local knowledge. And Africa mm. has unbelievable local knowledge. It's not for That's us to go point. in some not way. Not just local knowledge, but like indigenous knowledge. Exactly. Oh my goodness, yes. And it's not about us coming in, we're going to make you aware. They might not, communities might not be actively engaged in all our organizations and the work we do, et cetera, and on the forefront. But my goodness, they know there's a crisis. They try their best to, you know, use the solutions that they have been using for decades and decades. But of course, systems will uh, continue to undermine that. But so we mustn't assume we have all the knowledge. And the IPCC has been very clear about yeah. this as well, right? Yeah. And so that is not being highlighted because it's not sexy enough. It's mm -hmm. not going to make headline news. It's not going to. But so let's not think because we're not reading the stories in The Guardian that we have a huge challenge on our hands that people are not aware. People, when, when you can't help people in Mozambique who's gone through literally the, those two experiences or people in Nigeria or on the Horn of Africa where people are on the brink of starvation that they're not aware of this crisis. They are the most painfully aware. Are they recognized and acknowledged at all? No. Yeah. That's and, and the mindset that needs to change. But we, we work in the continent and through our organizations, whether it's local projects with communities, learning from their knowledge, looking at adaptation approaches, looking at how we can minimize the risk, et cetera, et cetera, that work is being done. It's just not on the and, front pages of newspapers. And Sharon, I was just about to go to you. And in your comments, I want you to tackle the, the issue of, of listening and humility because you, mm. don't, you don't manage mm. 200 million workers globally without mm. needing to, 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 to listen and, to, and you know, to take in information. Absolutely. And listening and working with the people, Tasneem mm. said it all. You know, we are a broad church trade union movements from many countries, and I was going to say it earlier, we take pride in representing and increasingly organising uh, what we call informal workers, subsistence workers, but we need to, we have a broken labour market. 60% of our world's workers are in informal work, no rights, no minimum wage, no social protection. This is a disaster and it's all down to governments who failed in the, force, in the face of corporate pressure to actually deny workers secure jobs and uh, those fundamental rights. But we also know even of the 40% that more than a third in our very insecure, um, precarious work. And of course, these crisis areas, the convergence of crisis that we've had uh, in the last, um, in the last uh, decade is just extraordinary and making it worse. But I wanted to say two things that Tasneem's right about local knowledge, and it always really annoys me. It comes from a country where we have First Nations, uh, um, uh, we have First Nations peoples who have been denied uh, justice in in almost all aspects of their own development. If you really want to do something about biodiversity, you know, you wouldn't go to parts in uh, in the Daintree or in the northern. Uh, parts of Australia 
and get more knowledgeable people than the Indigenous people. They know what's happening to the turtles. They know what's happening to their the uh, fauna and flora in the, in the forests or on the beaches. This is something we have just totally ignored. We take no responsibility for reimbursing their knowledge, for paying for their knowledge, and we bring in outsiders not to work with them and listen, as you said, but indeed to kind of be the experts. I've always found that unbelievably arrogant. But the other thing I wanted to do is instill some hope, and Tasmin's right, people know. We just finished our, uh, our latest global poll. This is the highest figure ever. 66% of people are worried about climate change, 66. Two thirds of the community almost, you know, that's extraordinary. Yeah. And then you've got um, uh, more than three in every four people, 76% believe that workers have a right to know how employers are climate proofing workplaces, have a right Beautiful. to know transparency. And finally, that uh, indeed governments, almost 60% want their governments to do more to promote a just transition to a zero carbon future and say they would trust the government more if they did. So, mm. you know, people are telling us what it will take to trust their governments, democracy, what it will take to actually uh, get them to have some confidence, climate-friendly jobs. Pretty simple, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, yep. No, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think it's so important that we, we just understand where we are and what we need to do. You know, moving on from this, we have another pre-recorded uh, statement from Honorable Simon Kofi. And we go back to him. We asked him, how can the Commonwealth to do more to support and promote the needs and aspirations of its small and vulnerable states when it comes to the issue of just transitions. And when we come back, I'm going to ask each of you about what can the Commonwealth do so that we can, we can have that, that conversation. So we'll go to, to Minister Kofi and then we'll, we'll give him the stage and then we'll come back and talk about it. The Commonwealth must promote a shift in the leadership paradigm so that all countries, particularly the highest emitting countries within the Commonwealth, take greater responsibility for the crisis that we are facing right now. That shift should also aim to give smaller Commonwealth countries, including my own, a greater voice in policy discussions and debate. We need both domestic action and international cooperation to explicitly stop the expansion of fossil fuel emissions and the production of coal and gas to fulfill the aims of the Paris Agreement. The Commonwealth should take the lead in encouraging all member states to revise their nationally determined contributions in order to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The Commonwealth should encourage its members to develop focused climate policies and concrete measures that deliver equitable solutions to contribute to climate change mitigation and observation. All Commonwealth countries should unite at COP27 in calling for the phasing out rather than the phasing down of not only coal, but all fossil fuels. The 2.5 billion people of the Commonwealth also have a role to play. They must put pressure on their leaders to openly address issues of climate change because the climate crisis affects us all. Our Pacific family might be feeling the impacts of climate change and sea level rise today, but in a hundred years, we will all suffer the consequences of inaction. Faftailasi Tuvalu Muteatua. All right, I'm going to invite my panelists to come back on and I'm going to ask Sharon. Sharon, you know, you understand about power in numbers, right? And so what the Commonwealth can do, or I don't, what the Commonwealth can do really focuses a lot on us having strength in numbers. So how do you think we can leverage this value of the Commonwealth, um, our strength in numbers to, to, to have real impact? So... The value of the Commonwealth has to, of course, first of all, as Tasneem alluded to and Rachel, you would know, has to be on the basis of equal partnerships. It can't be on the basis of an old colonial model. Mm -hmm. And I say that as an Australian, not just as a, uh, and, and really particularly thinking about, you know, the, the damage that has been, you know, done to our Indigenous uh, peoples through a model that just hasn't allowed them the dignity of their own uh, sovereignty and, um, and development. 
amongst other things. But, you know, if that partnership is there, if there's a genuine solidarity that binds that partnership from the richer nations like my own and, of course, the UK to the, uh, you know, in, in terms of their commitments to the developing economies, you know, I come from the Pacific. It breaks my heart to hear people in the islands talking about how they'll preserve atolls for cultural visits for their people. It's true that the Pacific Islands could settle pretty much in, uh, in New Zealand, in Australia, maybe in Hawaii, but, you know, there are indeed, that's a second choice for those people. They want mobility, they want educational and, and labour mobility, but they, like all of us, love their homes. You know, they are imbued with the spirit of their own cultures and their own lands. So we have to fight. We really have to fight, is my message. And if the Commonwealth can do that as one of the networks in the world that is prepared to put itself in the shoes of the poorest and most vulnerable amongst us, then solidarity has to be the test. Are we prepared to share wealth? Are we prepared to share technologies? Are we prepared to stand side by side and support the aspirations of those who are most at risk? And Dipti, I'm gonna ask you, how can small and vulnerable countries within and outside of the Commonwealth claim a voice in these policy discussions around the just transition, especially considering you know, the energy systems because that's where the money is? You know, as you, you talked about following the money, uh, you know, that's where the money is. So, so how can we claim a voice? I think what Sharon said is very, very key now. It has to be about equal partnership. It has to be about understanding what got us to this point in the first place. You know, there are there are so many parts of the world where history textbooks are being re rewritten. The history is being rewritten. It's Thank being God. whitewashed. And that's oh, a huge I thought you meant in the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's being whitewashed. You know, colonialism is being written out of textbooks. What wow. happened in the South is being written out of textbooks. And that really scares me because if we don't know where we came from, if we don't know the power how we got here, how we got here, the power relations that brought us to this point, which still exist, we're not going to know the way forward. So we need to mm. acknowledge a body like the Commonwealth needs to acknowledge that every single party to that group has a role to play, but that different groups have different roles to play. Different countries, Australia and the UK, have a very different role to play in the Commonwealth than South Africa and Mozambique and, and India and Pakistan. That's right, Mozambique is also in the Commonwealth, even though we were not a British colony. We're just coming along for the ride. <laughs> so each- It looks like a good time. We're gonna join. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So we need to we need to base ourselves in reality. It doesn't mean that we constantly keep blaming people for colonialism. It means acknowledging the evils of colonialism and acknowledging that everyone today living in the global north, I myself have a connection to the US, acknowledging our own privilege where we came from what brought us to this point being thankful and grateful for it and saying you know what i'm going to use my privilege to dismantle the power relations that got me here because that's what the world deserves mm. that's what the vast majority of this planet who are suffering that's what people deserve so it's it's coming from a place of deep understanding and it's coming from a place of how are we going to build our common humanity to actually take ourselves forward? And the Commonwealth is an amazing space to do this because there are so many different types of countries with such different histories and such different realities and such different futures. Tuvalu is not going to have land to stand on after a while. They're going to be, as, as Sharon said, they're going to be living elsewhere and visiting their atolls. Mm. So given that we need to understand where we came from, where we are, and then how are we going to acknowledge that and move ahead in a way that honors the earth and honors the fact that we are all connected? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Tasneem, Tasneem, what is the role of the Commonwealth in supporting this fair and equitable transition? And what is their role in, in 
funding men member states, particularly small and vulnerable states? And how can the Commonwealth lead the way for small and vulnerable states to work together for a just transition by scaling up ideas and initiatives to the regional and global level and engaging in collective solutions? And I want to add to that question. I think there are lots of solutions coming out of the global south that are not even being acknowledged as solutions. And, and if there is one thing that I, I want to go on record as saying, the global north cannot be the sole beneficiary of the opportunities that this climate emergency creates. They have, we can't just be the place where we get solutions and we're like, okay, hey, here's what we've done for you. No, we have to participate in the financial opportunity. Otherwise, as Dipti has been telling us and Sharon and Tasneem, we are recreating and building upon the broken system that got us to this place. <laughs> there you go. All I can say is- I, I know I'm supposed to be moderating. I'm not necessarily contributing. No, that's yeah, gone out yeah, the window I, now. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and just building off that, I think, you know, the, this point about a deep acknowledgement that that past, which is not actually the past only. Hey, I mean, if you're following what's going on nowadays, colonialism is making a comeback big time. This is the most scariest thing that I, because people in the North are literally on social media talking about how colonialism was damn good for us in the global south it's, it's it brought civilization it's it's, 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 it's it's happening again yeah. it is it is a exactly. new version yeah exactly yeah, yeah. and this latest rush for gas for extractivism in africa and, and, and women are complicit in this nonsense so we are this is that frontier and so just going back and reflecting as a commonwealth those who have power and resources in the Commonwealth, that power and resources built off the backs of the Global South, members of the Commonwealth, that deep acknowledgement has to exist. Because when we talk climate finance in multilateral spaces, there's this kind of notion that this is charity. This is aid. No, my friends, you know, and I'm going to use the R word that many Commonwealth countries don't like to hear. This is reparations for past injustices, current injustices. So let's not shy away from that history. We have to stay it in the face and deal with it. And then based on that, like Sharon speaks about what people want, you know, to be able to trust and move forward. We need that too. We need that trust again so that we can move forward. So certainly acknowledging and then of a basis of trust and international solidarity, we move forward because the solutions are there. You're right. And many of those solutions come from the global south. Yeah. They're coming to extract the solutions in the global south to make profits in the global north. We're not stupid about these things. And this is something that we, our governments who represent us, must stop selling out. Which they but do. It, I, but I think regularly. it's about our powerlessness. I think it's about our powerlessness. I, uh, look, do you think uh, that if they felt empowered that they would, they would sell out? They need if to they know their power they comes from the support of their own field. citizens. They need to know their power comes from the power of their own citizens and that they've been elected to represent their citizens. And citizens know what they want their governments to do. When you go into negotiations at international levels, of course, other dynamics play out and power does affect. But they need to have faith in us. We're going to yeah. stand behind our governments if they stand for us. Yeah. We're going to, right? I mean, we get so disappointed, Rachel, every time some other little country of ours just willing to trade off very important things from mm. their own people's interests for some or other something in a text somewhere, the issue mm. of liability for loss and damage, right? Mm. Powerful yeah. US forces. But we, if we stood united in the Commonwealth, those in the Commonwealth who are actually supposed to be standing united, yeah. against resources and power, we should unite. So there's two aspects of unite. uniting us in the Commonwealth from the global south, the victims of colonialism to a large extent, and then the common unity and solidarity between those and the acknowledgement from the global north about this history yeah. and the fact that they're going to undo it. 
I think I'm the sorry, Commonwealth can, the, yeah, the, the, the Commonwealth can serve as connective tissue, pulling us all together, making sure that we 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 have a we have this bigger voice, and that's I think for me that's the role of the Commonwealth, getting us all you know singing from the same hymn sheet, not their not the colon the colonizers hymn sheet, but our own hymn sheet, and having a collective voice so that when we speak as one nation, they can't pick us apart. No, exactly. They can't pick us Which apart. Which they do. To, Oh, they do it all the time because, you know, because we're so diverse, we have different needs. We're in different situations. And, and we're so, desperate. So, yeah, and we're desperate. And we're desperate. And the power dynamic keeps us in this subservient position. But there is power in numbers. And I think we also need to focus on convincing their voters, the voters in the big carbon emitting countries or the people yep. who, you know, and some of them don't have voters, right? But even though their people, if we can convince their people, they will get the politicians to act. All right, so now we'll get to the one big ask. And this is about in one minute or less, what single thing, if I gave you one wish for COP27, what single thing would you wish for? And I'm gonna start with you, Tasneem, and then I'm gonna go to you, Sharon, and then I'm gonna finish with you, Dipti. Tasneem, if I gave you one wish, I'm a genie in a bottle. Right. Based on what you just said, the unity of those in the Commonwealth, the Global South, go and stand united behind the decision for a decision to set up a loss and damage finance facility. Okay. And Great. that decision must be made at this COP. No time yes. to lose. And I'll just add that the Caribbean has suggested that we have a single digit tax on the export of fossil fuels to fund that loss and damage facility. And you guys should get behind us, get behind us and support it. Yeah, that's how we're gonna get it funded. Sharon, one thing. I mean, loss and damage, financing loss and damage. If we don't do this, then you can't build trust. Now, the creativity of the finance mechanisms, yours is a good idea, there are others. But it must be based on two things, ambition, people-centred just transition, and indeed loss and damage. If you have that mix, then we can actually scale up. We have to do the job, more than half the job by 2030, or we're in a losing battle. Let's do it together. Yeah. And Sharon, you know, I have not acknowledged you have underscored the, the concept of trust repeatedly through this conversation. And I think that's so important because apart from the goal, that trust is slipping away from us. I absolutely feel like that is the key to us getting more action. It is that people need to trust what, what the decision makers, the, the negotiators, what everybody's doing. Dipti, we'll close off with you. One wish, COP27. Since I'm a rule breaker, I'm going to talk about two really quickly. <laughs> Everything that these ladies said, but also we need to deal with the issue of shrinking civil society space. We're going to come across that like this in Egypt. It's happening in our countries. It's happening in Mozambique right now. And we need to push back because that is our voice, civil society and people's voice and democracy. So that's a really important work that we need to do in Egypt and we need to continue to do it. The second thing, the very basis of it all, this sounds all doom and gloom, but it's actually beautiful. All the beauty of the world exists in us building a system with values that support human life, that support the planet that keeps us alive, that supports us interconnected as human beings. It's Ubuntu, the concept that comes from Southern Africa. I am because we are, there is no other way of looking at it. I do not exist outside of this planet and I do not exist outside of every single person that lives here along with me. That needs to be the core of everything at COP27. I'm gonna say this again at COP27, but we need to carry this forward because it's not going to be solved at COP27, but that's what we need to be focusing on. Ubuntu, our shared humanity and our place on this planet that keeps us alive. Absolutely. Oh my God. I, I could not have closed it better. Thank you so much, Dipti. And I miss Alisi because I, I know she would have had a, a massive intervention as well, especially on behalf of the youth. Thank you so much. It has been my honor to moderate this panel. I have learned so much from each and every one of you. You have been amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually like... <sighs> 
<laughs> you know, and, 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 and let's just say, you know, if we just had more women in leadership across the board, this would be solved. This would be solved. If I got a one wish. <laughs> okay, except for trust, by the way. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Fabulous. Fabulous. So I just want to thank everybody who stuck with us through this entire conversation. I think it's been an absolutely brilliant conversation. The Commonwealth Foundation's next critical conversation will be next week, Tuesday on the 25th of October at 10 a.m. Trinidad and Tobago time, 9 a.m. in Jamaica and 3 p.m. in London. It will be on dun, 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 climate reparations. What much will uh, COP27 deliver? We will have another excellent lineup of speakers discussing progress and challenges around loss and damage. I know we talked about it a lot today, but there's a lot to, to talk about in loss and damage. And it's likely to take center stage at COP, as well as the efforts of small island states to seek legal, not just advice, but legal redress and possible litigation against industrialized countries for their climate inaction. So stay tuned, please be a part of that conversation. We'd also like to let you know about another related event on tomorrow, Wednesday the 19th, hosted by the Institute for Commonwealth Studies, titled Challenges to Commonwealth Green Transitions, the case of Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago. And they are doing amazing things. I really encourage you to be a part of that conversation as well. This will be at 6 p.m. London time or 1 p.m. here in Trinidad. But we are sorry that we didn't get to all of the fabulous questions that you sent through. Some of the questions converged. Some of the answers came out through um, the conversation that we were having. And thank you for joining us from all around the globe. You can continue this conversation by joining the Foundation's digital discussion platform. It's an innovative online discussion space for activists, practitioners, academics, and civil society leaders to network, share ideas, and build solidarity around the issues we've discussed today. I really encourage you to join. Please use the link posted um, in the Zoom chat by the Foundation's backstage team to join, meet, and strategize and, and create action with other climate activists. It's also a great way to network. We'd also love for you to continue the conversation on social media. This conversation, this isn't the end of the conversation, but the beginning. So on Twitter and Instagram at, at, Commonwealth at Commonwealth Org. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and goodbye. I really, really appreciate all of you. Thank you once again. It has been my honor. Bye. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Stay See strong. You. See you at COP27. All of yes, you. we have to link up. <laughs> <laughs>